first of all, let me say thank you for coming. We are absolutely delighted to have you here today. I'm Brian Thomas, your small business banker, area manager for Suffolk County. How many of you, by a show of hands, love your banker? <laughs> show of hands? Not many. All right. Not many. All right. By the end of today, you guys are going to love Capital One Bank. Darius <laughs> right. is the only one that's like, hey, he's my banker. So if you, you want uh, some words of advice. So thank you again for coming. We have a great presentation lined up for you this evening. Uh, before I begin, just would like my uh, my small business bankers here from Capital One to stand up. We got Michael Picard. Where's Eric Lancaster? Chris Mahaffey. They're here to answer any of your questions afterwards, and there will be plenty of time for you to have a conversation with them, so you can hear the, the Capital One commercial. Right now, I'm not here to give you a commercial on the bank. I'm here to introduce my my senior credit executive. Tom Clements, who's going to give you a presentation on how it is you can dress your business for success. So without further ado, Mr. Clements. Thank you. Thank you very much. After this 15-minute presentation, you're all going to be qualified for bankers. So, you know, just pass your resume. Uh, sure. I'll try and project. I, uh, I, I was faced with a pivotal point in my life back in 1984. I graduated college and I had to get a job. Now, if some of you remember what it was like in 1984, the economy wasn't much better than what it is now and it may have been worse. That's when interest rates were, you know, 18% prime and all that stuff. So um, I had to be creative in finding a job. I had to compete with a few jobs. So, just out of school, I started reading whatever I could. I, uh, you know, read how to interview, I uh, read up on prospective companies, and I stumbled upon a book called Dress for Success. Yep. Now, it was a very interesting book, kind of taught me a few things, but there was a great line in it I still remember today. It said, don't dress for the job you have now, dress for the job you want. So if you wanted to be a manager, dress like a manager. If you look successful, that's going to help you be successful. Okay? So let's fast forward 20 something odd years later. I look back, I reflect every now and then to see why some of the small businesses I see don't get approved for the loans that they need to help grow their business. And it's usually pretty much the same things. They're not showing stable profitability, enough cash flow to pay for the loan that they're requesting. Or two, there's no equity in the business, so they're very leveraged. Or three, poor credit, right? Now I'm thinking, these aren't bad companies, these aren't bad people. It's just they're not dressing for where they want to be. They're just thinking about their business today. They're not projecting out 12, 24, 36 months where they want to be and how they have to dress up their financial statements to get there. <laughs> Key ratios that the banks look for, business debt service coverage, business leverage, personal debt to income, personal leverage, okay? Business debt coverage is one of the big ones. Is there enough cash flow in the business? Now, in this world of sub S corporations, a lot of people take all the money out of the business. Or the accountant wants the tax plan so they don't show a lot of income, which is fine. And that's great. But you got to think, if I want to buy a building 18 months from now, I got to show historical cash flow to pay the loan. So if you're thinking about expanding your business, which you always are thinking about expanding your business, that's what businesses do. 
you have to position your cash flow so you can support any debt you're going to take on. And we look at cash flow, we're talking about EBITDA, net profit or earnings, we add back appreciation, interest expense. If you're buying a building, we'll add back rent expense because you're going to use that to pay the potential mortgage. It gives us cash flow divided by debt service is our mortgage, term loans, lines of credit. Okay? We generally, banks generally look for 1.25 times debt service coverage on that. Okay? Next slide. Business leverage. When you take all the money out of the business, there's no capital left in the business. Capital is your investment in the business. You know, it helps tide you over in bad times. But also, banks like to see you have as much money as they do. Hey, Tom, sure. talk a little louder. Okay, okay. So, when we look at business leverage, we look at total liabilities, divided by equity and land back office or loan, subordinated debt, right? So we generally look for ratios under three times. So it's very important for a growing company to retain some of its earnings so you can build a base for the future. Make sense? Is subordinated loans considered? We treat subordinated loans very often people take the money out of the business because they're going to be taxed on it anyway. <coughs> they lend it back to the business as officer loans, and if they subordinate that to the bank, we treat it as capital. We understand the tax laws, you know, and the implications of the sub S corporation, right? So we try and give them every benefit as, as possible. Okay? So the net paperwork comes from Cap One. Yeah, it's part of uh, it's just a subordination agreement. Right. You'll have your loan note and it'll be a subordination agreement. You know, you Talk a little bit more about the bank of, you know, telling the, the clients uh, that we all have no problem. Write out a check fifty thousand give to the government for the taxes. You know, easier said than done. You gave you gave thirty seconds. You know, no question about it. It's listen. It's an art. I'm not a side. Question. Repeat the question. Uh, the question is, if they show the income, they're going to have a bigger tax liability. <coughs> okay, which is a very valid question. And if I wasn't spending, you know, have a big project down the road that I have to prove to the bank that I have the wherewithal, I would minimize my taxes too. Listen, that's really what we all want to do, and you know, that's no surprise to anybody. But if you're going to look for a loan down the road, you have to show the historical, you know, substance to back up the loan. Make sense? You know, it's a cake and eat it scenario. We say it's a cake and eat it scenario. You can't have any cake and eat it dip. You know, you can't have, minimize your taxes. But you got to show enough income, enough capital to support the loan. Okay? Personal debt to income ratio. We also look at that because we're talking about sub S corporation. Now, you are the business. So, if you have a high personal debt to income ratio, you got to get that money from somewhere. You pay the personal debt to the business. So, it could impede the business and the ability to borrow. So, you got to keep an eye on both. Right? Generally, we look for 40% uh, personal debt to income ratio. We're getting it right now. Okay? Uh, we look at it if there's. Uh, Excess cash in the business and go through personal debt, that's fine. If there's excess personal <coughs> cash flow, we would add it back to the business if the business was tight. So, you know, we're in business to make loans, so we're trying to make it for our cash. Okay? Uh, personal credit, business credit, there's no mitigant to poor credit. So, start early. Work on your credit. Between, check it every now and then. Okay. You see any discrepancies on it? Have that taken care of as quickly as possible. If you have any judgments, it's not going to kill your possibility of getting a loan. But what you want to do is uh, take care of them and keep top 
copies of the paperwork from those satisfactory judgments. So when the bank asks for them, you have them right there. Okay? Next slide. So that's it. Okay. I was given 10 minutes and I made it 13 or so. Any questions while I'm here? Everybody feel like they're a banker now? <laughs> if you have installment arrangements from the days when you started your business, which New York State sales tax, IRS, New York State, but under control, being taken care of, paying like clockwork on a monthly basis, what is, how does that affect, if anything, or do you just need a letter from the CPA, the package, how does it affect? I believe the question was if you have installment payments from a taxing authority, you know, how do we treat that? Uh, it's not necessarily a negative thing and a deal breaker. It's like with the judgments. If you have the documentation and you share it with the bank, you know, we can get past that. It's not all about the numbers. It's really about the story. So don't uh, clam up when your banker starts asking you questions. Be open and forthcoming. You know, it really is about the story, about the personal story, about the business story. Ah, good question. Uh, I'm in the what quality of statements and at what thre uh, threshold of the loan do you require? Now, again, that's kind of a gray area. Try and be flexible. Uh, in small business, we don't see a lot of audit level statements unless we're not for profits. Okay, we see a lot of tax returns compiled and you know maybe review level statements. Once you start getting into the several million dollar size loan and for the middle market. Uh, customer, then we're looking at a lot of the statements. So a review statement won't mean anything as opposed to a compilation coming to the table. A review statement means a lot more than I, that's a really, the question was, do we view a review level statement better than a compiled statement, or for that fact, the tax return? Yes, a review statement, uh, we put a lot of things to, because uh, it's where the accountant actually goes in and does some testing on the customer's uh, record keeping, internal record keeping. So uh, yes, I would say if you start looking for credit from a bank over a million dollars and push it in higher than that, you would start contemplating getting a review level financial statement. It makes the bank feel really comfortable. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. So we're about to have our main presenter come up to speak to you about capital raising, uh, this capital raising workshop. Uh, before I do, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Mr. Minerva, who is our, our market sales exec. He's the gentleman that has allowed me to go out there and partner with the small business community hosting functions like this so that we can differentiate ourselves from some of those other banks out there that you may be with. So thank you, Mr. Minerva, I appreciate thank it. You. Now I have to read a little bit of a bio here, so bear with me. I know very well, and I was just at a recent workshop where he was fantastic. Um, he's with Biz World Partners, and he's had 13 years experience as a principal agent, intermediary, mediator, and supervisor of substantial negotiated transactions. He has been involved in several hundred business deals of all types. Has intensely studied negotiations, mergers and acquisitions, and capital raising as a di discipline, and used this knowledge to survive and prosper as an entrepreneur who started at the young age of 22. You say how old do I now, Julio, or is that on? <laughs> it seems like it's not much older, but I promise you when he speaks, you'll feel like he's significantly uh, higher than that. Is the CEO and one of the founders of Biz Grow Partners, a company that assists small and medium-sized businesses grow, expand, and transition either by increasing their sales or executing strategic deals that can lead to accelerated growth. JC, 
along with his partner Marty Hoppenberg and Sam Maldonado, have been individually responsible for raising millions of dollars in equity and debt financing throughout their business careers on behalf of privately held companies in the private space. And with that, JC. Good evening. I, I was informed that I have to yell in this environment so because I don't have a microphone, so bear with me, the front row here. Um, in terms of my age, I have a colleague who, who has time and time and time and time again has told me that he has shoes older than me. <laughs> That's Arnie over there. Arnie, your hand. Arnie, I just want to tell you that's inspiring. <laughs> that's it. You look better in your shoes. That's, well, hopefully my shoes are not my age. My shoes are good. That's it. <laughs> well, and, and, and I tell you, Arnie, the, the one thing when you tell me that, you know, you have shoes older than me, sometimes I think that you haven't been shopping in a, <laughs> a long time. <laughs> There you go. All right, real quick, um, you know, sometimes when we do these little workshops, I become like a little bit of a research junkie because, you know, although all the information I'm going to share with you today is very practical in nature, meaning we've done it, we continue to do it, we have knowledge of it, um, the, the, I, I become a research junkie. So in my little research junkie activity in the last two weeks, I've, I've actually came up with five sets of facts that I want to share with the audience today before I even begin this presentation that I think might be relevant to your careers. Uh, so let me share with you. Uh, so statistic number one. Um, I still learned, and you might know, and what I want is I want feedback from the audience whether you knew what I'm talking about or whether what I'm saying is a little surprising to you. And I'm going to ask the audience. I'm going to pose this question to the audience. So, one, nine out of ten businesses fail within seven years. Now, how many people in the audience knew that? How many people in the audience are still a little surprised at that? Now, I looked at this, and I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is interesting. This is common knowledge. But I remember when I was starting to get into business, say, or, or thinking about getting into business, 1998, 1999. Now, 1999 was like the Pax Romana of the United States economic prosperity, right? The Pax Romana. That was a period of time in the Roman Empire from 50 AD to 200 AD when you had total economic prosperity. You had uh, prosperity with regard to economics. You had prosperity with regard to culture. It was, it, it was a good time. And when I think about 1999, right, in the United States, that was the year where we were at our height. Who would agree with that, by the way? Who would agree 1999, very good time to be in business, right? But I remember when I got started and I was studying statistics with regard to small business ownership, that back then, nine out of 10 businesses failed within seven years too. That even during our height of prosperity, nine out of 10 businesses failed, even in 1999. So, so much for the economy, right? Now 2013, same statistics. So even though I knew the statistics, I compared it to 1999, very interesting. All right, statistic number two. I, I want to get a little feedback for the audience. 3% of all small businesses reach $1 million in revenue. And to add to that, 0.06% of all businesses in the United States of America reach $5 million in revenue. How many people knew that? How many people are a little surprised at that statistic? Right? Pretty interesting, right? All right. Number three. Five percent. Five. Five percent 
of all businesses that engage in the capital raising process procure one dollar for their venture. One dollar. Out of the audience, how many people knew that? Out of the audience, how many people are a little surprised at that statistic? Look at that. <laughs> how about this? Part of what we're going to talk about today is why. There's reasons for that. There are actual reasons for that. I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about why that actually is. That's a real statistic, by the way. All right, number four. All right, now this is this is a little interesting to me. Ten years from now, ten years from now, ten trillion dollars of wealth will be passed on to baby boomer women. Look at some of the men in the audience <laughs> questioning who they married. <laughs> Ten trillion dollars passed off to baby boomer women. Who in the audience knows why? Wait, 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 I got it. Huh? You outlive the men, the men are all going to die. And there are some exceptions to the rule. This is very helpful for capital raising. <laughs> Look at the women in the room. <laughs> we, should be, we should be developing business plans for them. <laughs> All right, and number five, and this is actually true, 30%, one out of three, of all human beings are dumb and moronic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Of all people, all human beings. Now, out of the audience, how many people thought that was a little higher? <laughs> now, now a lot of these statistics can be tested with Google. You can just Google and test me. See how valid these statistics are. But in that last statistic, I don't think you could do, I don't think you even need to do a Google. You can just do a simple exercise. I want you to look to the person to your right and take a real good look at that person to the right. And then I want you to say to the person to the left and take a real good look at that person. And if the person to your left is not dumb and moronic and the person to your right is not dumb and moronic, you might have arrived to an interesting conclusion. There you go. Anyway, that's a little statistics. A couple of thank yous. I want to control the crowd. This could get crazy. You know, there's no cell phone uh, reception here. So this turn off the cell phones doesn't apply. I like, I like these dungeon-like environments. Originally, we were going to be upstairs in this like plush, executive-like room. But this is a little old school, so I like that. So I don't, no problem with that. So I don't even have to tell you to turn off your cell phones. But turn off the cell phones, anyway. Couple things, I, no problems with questions. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of questions. I'm gonna engage the audience. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you some very interesting information. And I'm gonna make sure you guys wanna ask questions. But what I'm gonna ask you is, ask questions pertinent to the information I'm gonna present to you. And then we're gonna have a little bit of a Q&A at the end. And then we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna actually talk a little bit about this whole topic there. Um, just quick, before I get started, uh, I would, uh, it, it really would not be good of me to actually not recognize some certain people here. So let me, let me give you a couple of thank yous. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Martin Hoffenberg. Marty, raise your hand. <laughs> Mar Marty is the chairman of BizGrow Partners. The one thing I love about Marty is his name, Hoffenberg. That's a powerful name. Very good with uh, capital raising. <laughs> I would have been good with Hoffman, but Hoffenberg is like gravy here. <laughs> I mean, maybe not better than Arnie Silver. Arnie's actually uh, uh, a regional partner here in Manhattan, and Silver is as good as it gets. But I like Hoffenberg. <laughs> um, so thanks to Marty. Uh, second, I'd like to thank Brian Thomas, Capital One. 
Brian and I got together and he wanted to do an event and we made it happen. So, uh, and I thank Brian for his uh, progressive action here. Uh, Chris Johnson, where's Chris Johnson? There you go, our video guy. We're, we're YouTubing this whole thing. Please behave. <laughs> it will be recorded. Um, Ellen Volpe, ABA. Ellen, stand up. <laughs> Ellen's like the mayor of Long Island. No one has more connections than this woman. Um, her partner, Gene, is not around. I was going to tease Gene. His name is Gene Brown. It's not as powerful as Hoffenberg. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Gene's not around, but Ellen's here, so I. Thank yeah. Ellen. I, I just have to say, there's somebody in the audience that's probably doing the best job I've ever seen giving his cards in. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> well, someone announced well, I don't want the best. I uh, want to be with the amazing. best. I want to surround myself with the best. By the way, I just want to I wanna, I wanna just introduce Ellen. Ellen is the founder and the CEO of ABA. ABA, which stands for American Business Associates, is the premier executive networking group in Long Island, really in the tri-state area. 13 groups, 250 members who attend these groups. I'm a member, I attend. High quality people. And um, who's a member here of ABA here, by the way? All right, good. So you have a couple people maybe. Who does not know what ABA, who's never heard of ABA? A couple people. What I want you to do is at the end of the event, introduce yourself to Ellen. She's well connected, and what I'd like you to do is have Ellen, I, I want to invite you to an ABA meeting and participate. So that's very important. And uh, last but not least, my brother, Sam Maldonado. Sam. <laughs> it, it, if you got bombarded with emails, it's his fault. <laughs> he put it all together and part of the reason why everyone's here. So that's some thank yous. Let's now go into program. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about four topics, four, four parts of this program, and I'm going to go into it fairly quickly. This is just really an introduction. Capital raising, by the way, is a complex subject, so it's not something that you're going to cover in an hour and a half. But hopefully what I could do is share with you some information, some ideas, so that you know, we could build a relationship. And more importantly, you, you get some ideas where maybe you can implement or start looking to research a little bit more intensely. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is, why is it important to be a capital raiser or someone who understands the capital raising uh, process? Now, show of hands, who here owns a business? You're an entrepreneur. You own a business. Why is capital raising important for you? Well, capital raising might be the, the single most important skill that you can possibly have. Capital raising uh, it encompasses sales, marketing, deal-making capabilities that enables you to fund your company. Very important. So that's, that's one. Now, I want to also, who here is an advisor to entrepreneurs? You're a coach. You're an attorney. You're someone who's an advisor to entrepreneurs. Bankers. <coughs> there you go, bankers. We, you're even allowed in this topic. <laughs> A lot of people were scared of this whole banking presentation in the beginning. <laughs> um, here's the thing with, uh, with advisors. Here, here's the thing I want to present to you, this idea. Um, if you understand the, the capital raising process, this actually enables you to network more effectively. Because if your clients need money, or they're trying to grow, or they want access to funds, and you're the person that actually presents them the opportunity, <coughs> the esteem in your client's eyes actually rises because you are able to make that high level connection. That's, another dif that's a different level of networking. So, uh, so e even if you look at yourself as an entrepreneur, you want to raise money, if you're someone who just sees themselves as a networker, as a connector, well, this kind of, the, the concept of capital raising is really probably the ultimate level of networking. Because if, you, if I'm an entrepreneur and you introduce me to money, now I'm going to look at you a little differently. I'm going to look at you as, hmm, here's my advisor, and, and, and in addition to the core service that, 
you're providing me, you're actually opening up doors for me. So that's a, a, a different level. Um, second thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about the truths regarding capital raising. And we talked about 5%. Who was surprised with that, by the way? 5%. Just want to get another hand. 5%. Surprising statistic. Well, I'm going to reveal the truths of, of, of capital raising that actually will give you some awareness of why that is. And, and we're going to now develop some strategies to try to get funding for your company. Um, I'm going to share with you, third thing I'm going to share with you is there's a new paradigm for capital raising. It, it's new. It started to develop at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009. Companies in light of the elimination of banks, private equity, angel investing, the elimination of those kinds of entities in small business actually gave rise to a new paradigm in capital raising. A whole new entire cap, uh, paradigm, and I want to share that with you. And we're going to talk about that. And finally, and you know, I'm going to talk to you about really the best friend to small business. The part that you don't know. The part that most people don't know. I've, I've engaged in conversations with, with lots of entrepreneurs, attorneys, accountants. It's been something I've been studying for years. It's been something that's bewildered me for years. And what we're going to talk about is a little bit about Regulation D, the secret of small business, the best friend of small business. And we're going to talk about how the Jobs Act, you know, crowdfunding, has actually even made that uh, Regulation D more, even more attractive, but also have made it a little bit more difficult. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's get into the, um, the program. So, why is it important to be a capital raiser? I want a little feedback from the audience. What's the importance of having the skill from the audience? Without money, you can't run the business. Anyone else? Take advantage of opportunities. Opportunities. So if you have capital, maybe you could take advantage of more opportunities. Who, el who else could tell me why is it important to be a capital raiser? You're going to increase wealth for humanity. And increase what? You can increase wealth for humanity by knowing how to do that for everyone. You know, you make a good set. Justin, right? Yep. Um, it's a rare skill. We just talked about 5% of businesses know how to do it. It's a rare skill. Most people don't know how to raise money. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later on about how most people who are going about it are doing it illegally. And that's going to ruffle some feathers. Most people who actually go about raising money do it illegally. Right? We'll talk about that. And, and we're going to also talk about how trying to go about doing it illegally actually prevents you from raising funds. Because if you're a sophisticated investor and you actually have a clue, when you see a company trying to raise money and they're not doing it in a sophisticated manner, you start to question the competence of the entrepreneur. So that's something that we'll definitely talk about. Uh, but when you really think about it, the number one responsibility of an entrepreneur, when you really think about it, is to keep cash into the company. And one of the reasons why you, you need to be in the capital raising game is to keep cash running into the company. And you could do that with sales. You could do that with bringing in more business. But, but you need a little bit more than that. Sometimes you need cash. Sometimes you need money for growth. And this is a skill that needs to be acquired. Now think about it. How many CEOs you know right, are involved in the operations of their business? When you really think about it, what's the responsibility of a CEO? What should a CEO really be concentrating on? Watching the systems. Ellen said it, growing the business. So if you're delved in the operations part of the business, you can't grow the business. Why? Well, yeah, this <laughs> I have a gentleman in the front here, and he doesn't. He, by the way, he doesn't know anybody. His name is Justin. He knows me. 
and he met us, and I asked him, well, how did you find out about us? And he tells me, meet up. <laughs> and, he's, and he's 24 years old, and my brother puts on invite <laughs> and meet up, and you're here. Now, but my brother keeps on telling me, whereas there might not be many entrepreneurs in their 20s, and there's some statistics that support that actually entrepreneurship of people in their 20s is actually downward. If you're going to go and contact them, you're going to contact them through the internet. That's, uh, that's very interesting. I'm glad you came, by the way. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yes. All right, so, so when you really think about it, that one of the responsibilities of raising money from an entrepreneur's standpoint is to keep cash coming in to the company. And that's one of the, 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 the major responsibilities. Now, I want to talk about a second obligation, all right, which or a second reason why you need to be in the capital raising business, right? Now, how many people here own a business? They have ownership in a business. Okay. How many people here own multiple businesses? All right, so you have multiple businesses. If you want to own multiple businesses, one of the ways you could acquire ownership in a company is to simply be a capital raiser. If you bring money to the table, then you're able to actually own a business. Now, I don't know if Arnie's here. Arnie, are you, are you is Arnie. All right, Ar Arnie, and I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but, we'll put, but this is interesting because I think a, a, a gentleman of this stature needs to share his experience. Um, Arnie started with nothing. He was a school teacher, right? As a it's not nothing, but it's something. <laughs> he was a gym teacher. There you go. He decided that one day he was going to open up a Burger King. So he opened up a Burger King. And as you stated, right, you use your own resources to open up that Burger King, his own money. And he had a store. And this was Burger King in the 1970s. This is not Burger King today. This is Burger King in the 1970s, which is a different time period, right? So then Arnie, at some point, says, you know what? I want to open up more stores. Now, if he opens up more stores, right, that's additional businesses, additional locations with additional revenue, additional expenses. So what does Arnie do? Arnie, did you use any of your money? Never to this day. <laughs> Never to this day. He also opened up a Fridays using the same kind of methodology, and he raised the money. Now, Arnie, at this point, demonstrated the competence to actually operate a store. But Arnie took it a step further by actually opening up six additional stores using other people's money. Now, Arnie, in raising peop other people's money, right, did you acquire ownership in those stores? Absolutely. How much ownership? 50%. So Arnie acquired 50% ownership in six additional stores in addition to the one, the, the original Burger King that he opened up using his additional money. Now Arnie, you raised the money, right? From several investors. One major one and then a couple after ones, right? So the point I'm trying to impress upon you is that the skill of raising money actually enables you to acquire ownership. So in addition to uh, uh, it being your number one responsibility, one of the advantages of raising money is that you can acquire ownership of a company. It's one of the few skills that, you could, that enables you to acquire ownership of a company. And in Arnie's case, right, now people don't understand. They, they hear six Burger Kings or seven Burger Kings, right, and they think it's one company. It's not really one company, right? It's seven different companies. Seven different corporate entities. Seven different corporate entities, seven different financial statements, seven different income and expense statements, seven different forms of profit, right? 
So it's almost like seven different companies, but your capital raising capability acquired ownership in six companies without a single dime, correct? So. And I can buy shoes for that. That's it. <laughs> so what's the point? The point is that capital raising enables you to acquire ownership. Now, what? think about how you could acquire ownership in a company. You could, one, use your own money. Two, sometimes you have a technical skill that is really important to the business. Maybe you're an engineer. Maybe you're, it's in, a, in the accounting uh, uh, space. Maybe it's in the technology space. And because of that labor, you're able to acquire some ownership, right? But nothing beats capital raising. Nothing. Now, it's the fastest way to get ownership, but it's a skill that's really rare. And we're going to talk about that. All right? So, all right, let's talk about the three truths of, 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 of raising money. The three truths. All right, the first truth is, and, and this is, the three truths, by the way, reveal why only 5% are successful in raising money. And some of it is mental, and some of it is technical. So let's, let's talk about why. First and foremost, capital raising is first and foremost a sales and marketing activity. If you're weak in sales, you're weak in marketing, and you can't make a deal, you're bad in negotiations, this game is not for you. I'm sorry, it just isn't. So if you don't know how to sell, if you don't see yourself as a salesperson, if you don't see yourself as a marketer, and if you don't see yourself as a negotiator, you're not going to be able to raise money. Because no one, no investor is going to believe in you. No investor is going to invest in you. Because guess what? When you raise money, the first person that you sell, the first thing that you sell is yourself. Forget the product, forget the service. The first thing that people have to believe in is you. And if you can't sell yourself, you're not going to raise any money. And that's one of the reasons se selling is such a rare skill that, that, that that's part of the reason that prevents people from actually able to get funded. I mean, in the beginning, there was a little presentation by Capital One, right, about dressing for success. Well, I guess what they were impressing upon the audience is that part of even getting a bank to make a commitment to you is looking good, looking the part, looking like a professional. And that's part of the selling process. So I think it's important to understand that capital raising is a marketing and sales activity first and foremost. And without those skills, without making a commitment to developing those skills, you don't have to be a natural born salesperson, but you need to be competent and you need to be fluent in the area of marketing and sales in order to actually be able to raise money effectively. So that's uh, uh, one important part. The second important part is, uh, now this is a little subtle. This is really tough for people to understand. I don't know, it's like kind of like a contradiction in terms. So let me try to explain this. Um, you should never raise money when you need it. Um, Brian, Capital One, don't you throw plenty of emails and you make calls to people and lend the money to people who essentially don't need your money? Why is that? And there's, there might be another reason for why you solicit people who don't need your money. <laughs> you make money on it, and also they could pay you back. They know how to manage it. All right? So essentially, when you think about it, investors and banks and lenders invest money in people all the time who essentially don't need the money. Yet most people engage in capital raising when what? When they need the money. And what I'm going to impress upon you is that you should never, ever, ever, ever raise money when you need it. Now, how do I promote this? Because this doesn't, this might not even make sense. Part of this might not even make sense. Well, what do you mean? How, how can I, wait, wait, I need funding for my company. Well, the reality is, 
most companies don't need money to survive per se. How many times? Who here started their business, right, with no money? Who here operated their business with no investor? They did it themselves. When you think about it, most businesses are usually able to get by without capital. So when you have a business who's trying to raise money when they need it, you're only going to attract opportunists. You're only going to attract people who want to take advantage of you and who want to take control and want to negotiate majority shares of stock with you. Because if you need them, right, they start to question your competence as an entrepreneur. It's a subtlety. And that's something that, uh, it's a truism. Finally, when you raise money, you can't raise money around a product or service. You need to raise money around a business model that makes money. Because think about it. What are investors looking for? Feedback from the audience. What do investors ultimately want? A return. Think about it. A return. Do they care about your product? Or do they care about the money that will come back to them? They care about the return. So think about it. What do lenders, what do investors want? They want, and, and I'm going to also impress upon you this. They not only want a return on capital, think about what most investors are really concerned about. What are they really concerned about? Think about what investors really concerned I mean, the, Mel, Mel, Mel Bloom, right? I want to introduce you to the audience. Fa and and I, I like to introduce fascinating people. So if I introduce you, that means I really think you're fascinating. <laughs> Mel Bloom is an inventor slash entrepreneur, right? Is that a, a proper description for you? All right. Mel has invented dozens of products that you've raised money successfully, right? 24 patents. 24 patents all right? Now, Mel, and, and you've raised money successfully. Your experience, do they care? about the return, or is the first thing they're asking is, how are you going to get me my money back? Both. Both, right? They care about the product. They care about the individual. They want to know how much money they're going to get back over the period of time. Aren't they super popular? Same thing that I would be looking for if I was the investor. Exactly. Now, what I want to impress upon you is, return is nice. But the first thing that people want to know is, return of capital. Meaning, if there's a chance to lose, <laughs> what good is my return? Yeah, also minimal risk. Everybody wants minimal risk. Minimal yeah. risk. And when you say minimal risk, what you're really saying is, I want my money back. Essentially. Essentially. They're not looking at, wow, this, biz this business could make me a 30% return. No, they're saying, I'm investing a half a million, I'm investing a million, how do I get my million back? Then we can talk about the return. So when you raise money, you need to answer that question first. Meaning, when you present to an investor, the, the question you have to answer is, how do you get the money back to them first? And when, if they look at a financial statement and they see that you have a $300,000 salary, and they see that you have perks for a car, and they see that you have all this other stuff that supports your personal lifestyle, the investor gets nervous because they're thinking, and they're thinking, wait a minute, this entrepreneur is not thinking of getting my money back first. And that's all that investors care about first, is return of capital, right? As opposed to return on capital. Answer the question of return of capital first, and then you can get in, into the presentation with regards to what the return on capital will be. 
So that's um, uh, damn it. Now, when you think about it, we talked about not really raising money on products and services. Raise money around uh, profitable business models. And you know, there's a book called, and it's a very interesting book. It's called Get a Grip. Who's, who's read Get a Grip by Gino Wickman? Who's read that book? All right, very, very, very interesting. I'm surprised you didn't read it, Alan, because I, I think you're familiar with it. You missed that one. All right. Um, all right. Here's a, the book by Get a Grip by Gino Wickman. Now, Gino Wickman presents this concept of the entrepreneurial operating system, right? And, and you see things like this in books like The E-Myth. Who's read The E-Myth? OK, that's a more popular book. Um, and the reason why I kind of related to this book a little bit, because he broke down business in three, three components, and, and three very simple components. And he broke business down into A, sales and marketing, B, operations, and C, finance and administration. And the point that Gino was making was that, you know, you really can't run a business without three threes, th these three components running uh, effectively, right? Now, let's look at these three. Sale, well, let's look at marketing first. Marketing, what's the goal of marketing? What are you trying to achieve with your marketing? What, think about it, I want a feedback from the audience. What do you really want with your marketing? All right, you want your customer to know who you are. You get your name out. Who else? Any? Okay, a little return on investment. Cu customer base. Build a customer base. Okay. All right, so here's the thing. I, <laughs> you got it. Leads. I, and this is the part that I want to emphasize here. What's the emphasis of marketing? There's only one emphasis of marketing. Leads. And how about this? I'll amend that to qualified leads. The only reason why you invest in marketing is to get leads that are qualified. Right? Leads that could be converted into a sale. That's the point of marketing. And if your marketing is not generating you leads, you need to get with the program because your business could be potentially in trouble. The only point of marketing is to get leads, particularly for small and mid-sized companies. Branding is another story. It's another, it's another concept. But if you're going to invest money in marketing, you need to be in front of qualified prospects. Ellen has ABA groups. It's essentially a marketing forum. At the end of the day, if I'm going to go and participate in Ellen's groups for 12 months straight, what I'm really looking for is leads. Now, I have to do it about a more strategic way. I have to develop relationships. I have to feed the group. I have to give referrals. But ultimately, what I'm looking for is leads. At the end of the day, the whole point of marketing is leads. Sales. What's the point of sales? Audience. What? Close the leads. Revenues. The whole purpose of sales is to convert the leads that you received into sales, into revenue. You get five leads, you get one sale. You get 10 leads, you get three sales. You get six leads, you get three sales. You need to convert leads into sales. That's the point of sales. So when you look at your business, you ask yourself, all right, I have strategies here, and I have money I'm investing, and I invest this money and I get leads. But then there's leads that come in, I have to convert those leads into actual sales. Without sales, there's no revenue. Without leads, 
there's no sales. Sales and marketing is put together. They're different disciplines, but they're married because it, there's continuity between the two disciplines. And when you think about your business, think about, I need leads, I need sales. If you look at your month and you got no leads, how many sales are you going to get? Zero. And if you got 10 leads and you got zero sales, what does that tell you about your sales? <laughs> Someone said your sales suck. Isn't there like a company that your marketing sucks? <laughs> Who has ever heard of that company? Your marketing sucks. You heard it in the radio, you know? He tries to attack your self esteem or something. I don't know. He says your marketing sucks. That's how he starts off. He has like 20 million radio ads. <laughs> that's the first thing he tells you. He says your marketing sucks. Sales and marketing. So that's what happens in social media. We develop marketing and leads, but a very big percentage do not know how to collect it and close it, and that's become an industry unto itself. Well, correct. There's, um, yeah, there is a, 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 an industry of, of social media. Some people call it social marketing, right? And uh, how, how do you know if your social media is working? Well, does it generate leads? Qualified leads. Purposeful leads. Purposeful leads. And how about this? How do you know those leads are good? That they get converted. But you might generate leads and still not convert. So you always have to ask yourself the question, am I generating leads? And am I converting those leads? And that's the essence. So when you're raising capital, you need to lay out your sales strategy and your marketing strategy. Because investors feel a lot more comfortable when you know what you're doing. If you don't have a clear marketing strategy and a clear selling strategy, then the investor says to himself, this guy doesn't know what the heck he's doing, or this girl doesn't know what the heck he's doing. If I looked at a business plan, the first thing I'm looking for is what the sales strategy is, what's the marketing strategy. I want to know how do they intend to generate leads. Now, I come across business owners that absolutely have no strategy with regard to marketing. They don't have a clue. They don't have no idea how to generate leads, and they have no idea how to convert them. But they have the hockey stick? The hockey stick. Who here knows what the hockey stick is? Who's ever put together a business plan? Who's ever seen revenue go up, 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 and never come down? That's a hockey stick. There you go. Everyone fails at consistency, runs out of money, then marketing runs down, then sales plummet. Correct. So that's one of the things. You always have to invest in marketing and make sales, first and foremost. Now, sales and marketing is not enough. You could actually generate leads. You could generate, you could, you could put money in marketing. You could generate leads. You can convert those leads into sales, right? But the second part of business is operations. Now, audience feedback. What's the real goal of operations? Think about it. What is the goal of your operation? Huh? Customer satisfaction. Any other feedback? Support. Organization. Keep your clients your clients. So operations is about keeping your clients. Keeping your clients. And here's a little secret. Retention of clients equals profit. If you keep clients, and clients keep on coming in, and you keep them, the clients you keep produce what? Your profit. Retention of, of clients equals profit. And your operations has to be aimed towards keeping clients. You get the client, yes. Profit is another story. Revenue is what you get. Whether or not you make profit depends on your course. Well, we're going to talk about that, all right? But, but in general, assuming that your cost structure is, 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 is well put together, right? The goal of operations is to keep clients. The more clients you keep, the better. Dano, raise your hand. 
want to introduce Dano, very interesting character. Dano is, <laughs> and you like being an interesting character. D Dano actually has a business that's an entrepreneurial school, he, meaning he's teaching how to operate and run businesses effectively, right? All the skills associated. He has a school here in Melville, right? And if you enroll a student, right, and they pay your tuition, if you stay in touch with them and they continue to pay you, isn't that pure profit? Against cost, but assuming, wait, ass, here's, the, here's the idea I want to share with you. Assuming you're investing in marketing, and assuming you're converting a lot of those leads into sales, and new business is coming in, if you retain customers you've procured in the past, at some point, though that retention equals profit, pure profit so long as your cost structure is in order. Retention of clients equals profit, and that's the goal of operations, and that's what investors want to see. They want to see systems in place, strategies in place, for you to keep your customers happy, and so that they can, can keep on coming back. Third step of business, finance administration. I think that's what you were talking about, Steve. Finance administration, you're managing the monies. Right? You're managing the monies. You're making sure costs are down. And when you look at a business as an investor, right, the first thing you're looking for, where are the holes? Are the holes in marketing and sales? Are the holes in operations? Or are the holes in finance administration? And when you're raising money, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to present to the investor is you're trying to answer their concerns in these three areas. How am I going to generate leads? How am I going to convert leads? How am I going to keep customers? And ultimately, what's my strategy for managing the money? All right, so that, th that's truths of, of uh, that's, and, and that's the reason why a lot of businesses are, fail at raising money. They don't understand it. They don't understand the process. All right? Now, a little later on, I'm going to describe why most businesses actually go about raising money illegally. And we're going to talk about that. Now, let's talk about the new paradigm that actually developed in 2008. Now, 2008. Who remembers 2008? Who had businesses that got affected by what happened in 2008? Who personally actually felt trauma in 2008, 2009 from a business standpoint. So it's very interesting. You know, people, people share their experiences. 2008 was a tough time. And a lot of the problems in 2008 was related to money access. And it was a time where banks stopped. Banks just cut their lines of credit. A lot of businesses relied on their lines of credit from banks. They relied on lines of credits from bank to buy inventory so that they can sell the inventory to, to, to customers. And banks just said, you know what, we're not going to give you that line. And a lot of businesses got cut even though they were on good terms. They were paying, they were up to par, they had good credit, the, the owners had good personal credit, the business had good credit, and all of a sudden the bank tells them, you know what, we had a $5 million line and we're going to reduce that to a $1 million line. And that hurt business. So you had the elimination of banks. And that hurt a lot of businesses. That not only hurt a lot of businesses in their operations, that hurt a lot of businesses with regard to the growth of the business. Right? Second, venture capital, private equity, angel investors, all of these, all these entities essentially disappeared. They disappeared. In the world of small business, they disappeared. Now, some of these entities continued with regard to larger corporate transactions. But when it comes to businesses doing a million dollars in sales, and five million dollars in sales, and twenty million dollars in sales, and up to fifty and sixty and seventy million dollars in sales, these businesses disappeared. Right? These entities disappeared. Except for the uh, launch pad. 
The launch pad, explain that. The, uh, well, the la launch pad is a group of many all uh, that are angels, and they they have money. Well, that's a, hey, listen, there were always, there's always exceptions, right? I don't mean everyone disappeared. There's always exceptions, and that's good. And by the way, if you have a, a, a group or access to a group, I think you ought to promote that to this, in this event, or introduce yourself to some people, and. Or, or talk to us and we can talk to you. It's not mine, it's called oh. the launch pad. Like tomorrow night they have a pitch night mm -hmm. where five women owned businesses are going to be pitching to investors in capital. Okay. Is it Long Island? It's in New York. Ellen, you've heard of this? Anybody that's interested, ask me, I'll give them the information. But it's not my group, I'll be going there. All right, excellent, good. Good information. The la launch pad, right? Yes. And it's an angel group. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's an incubator. Yeah. We're going to talk about angels a little later on, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that. All right. So here's the new paradigm. I, w I want to discuss the new paradigm. First paradigm. The concept of growth capital. I'm going to go get into that. What's growth capital? Growth capital is fairly expensive money that private investors, lenders, um, banks will lend you. Growth capital is money you get, in, you get access to immediately. But it's expensive, typically. So if money is expensive, think about it. If money is expensive, where do you think you should invest that money if it's expensive? In the most secure returns. You raise money that's expensive. It's 10%. It's 15%. It's 20%. Right? It's expensive. Meaning you're going to have to, and it's short term. And you're going to have to pay that money back and you're going to have to give the investor money back, right? But it's expensive. Now, we talked about the aspects of business, sales, marketing, operations, administration. What part of that business can give you the quickest return? Sales, marketing. So if you, invest, if you raise money, growth capital, expensive, where should you invest that money in? Sales and marketing. Of course. If you have the sales and marketing, maybe you're better off investing in administration and finance, cut your costs and make more profit out of the same revenue. Well, you can invest money in, 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 in finance and administration, and you can cut costs, and you can produce profit. But the question is, at what what is your highest profit? What's the, pri uh, what's the highest potential of return on investment? Is it sales and marketing? Or is it in finance administration? Uh huh. The problem is with growth with growth capital. If you borrow money at a high interest and it's expensive, usually operations and finance administration won't give you the return that's necessary to cover the cost of capital. Your highest return on investment is always with marketing and sales. So if you get access to 100,000 and you have to pay a 20% return, right? Well, typically, investments in operation and investments in, in finance administration won't be able to cover the cost of that capital, meaning your best way to use that money is in sales and marketing. Now, what, what's, growth, what's, what's growth capital? Growth capital, this, and, and this, is, 
This is access. Today, you could get access to growth capital anyway. And if you don't know, just talk to us, and we'll tell you how to get growth capital. Actually, Louise. Wait, where's Louise? Louise owns a company called RX Plus. And it's uh, a specialty pharmacy business. And she services not only pharmacies in her immediate retail area, she, she, she actually services pharmacies all over the place, uh, out of Queens and Long Island, everywhere. She, she's able to deliver prescription drugs and diabetic supplies um, to your front door. She, she has that kind of business, right? And she was able to use the concept of growth capital to keep herself in business, keep herself uh, going forward and drive revenue, all right? So, so let me describe, and we did this for her, right? Several times we got access, we got your money. <laughs> Biz grows the best, I like that. There you go. There you go. She told me she's going to speak to the next event. So anyway, we, we've helped Louise get, uh, raise money, right? And one of the, um, one of the uh, things that we did was we, we got her access to money when she needed it. When she needed to pour money into her business and grow her business, we always answered her. And how, how did we do it? Well, what's growth capital? Growth capital is money you could get access that it ranges from 25000 to 250000 And you usually get it within three days to like two weeks. You get it quick. So you need money, we get it for you, right? And what is it usually? Well, we could get it in the form of hard money. There is a whole market of hard money, of investors that invest hard money for high interest returns. But I would never suggest that you invest hard money in operations or finance or administration. You don't want to take hard money and put it in and pay your rent or pay your mortgage. No, you want to take that money and put it in sales and marketing, get new customers, create activity, so that down the road, if you keep those customers, what do you have when you keep customers? What did I say before? Profit. If you keep customers, you get profit. That's the whole purpose of getting it. Not, not, not to, you want to break even on the initial raise, but you want to keep the customer and get profit. Right? So that's the whole point of, of hard money. There's bank lines. Brian, right? You approve a lot of bank lines. I think Capital One has a no-doc program, right? With no-doc, if you have good credit, you, you get to get access to like $50,000. No financial statements, right? They, don't check, they just check your credit. If you have good credit, they give you $50,000. Right? A lot of owners who have pretty decent credit, doesn't, they don't know that with their signature, they could uh, get access to sums of money, whether it be 50000 or 100 or 150000 With their financial statement, they could often get, uh, get access to more money, right? 50000 is just with a signature. With a financial statement and, and good credit, they could uh, get access to more money, right? Well, the question is, if you get access to that kind of money, what should you be doing with that money? Put it into sales. Put it into marketing. Put it into sales. Get new customers. Because the new customers will pay for the loan. And then when you keep the customers, what do you get? Profit. Profit. Money for operations. Huh? Money for operations. Money for operations. <laughs> You're trying to trick me. <laughs> if you put money, yes? Aren't you making an assumption that you're able to expand? Sometimes because of your physical plan, you can expand. What do you need money to build a, you know, build a bigger, build a bigger space, rent a bigger office? Sometimes you're at capacity. That's the operation. Well, all right. A, a, a good point. A practical point was raised. I'm behind on rent. I have payroll this Friday. I have, I have to survive, right? And now. Brian was nice enough to give me $100,000, right? I got $100,000 from Brian. So now the question is, I have payroll on Friday. Well, is payroll going to be $100,000? All right? It's pay I mean, if payroll is $100,000 for a week, that's, you have a pretty high payroll. But you have a payroll? <laughs> Potentially. Listen, here's the point. 
in most businesses, if you got access to capital, you can budget the money. You can take a portion. If you do have operational needs, you take a portion, you put it in operations, you survive, and you take the balance and you put it in sales and marketing. And again, what we're talking about is growth capital. Growth capital, from my standpoint, is lines of credit. It's hard money loans. There's another concept called cash advances. Actually, this is what we did with Louise, right? We've raised several cash advances. What's a cash advance? Cash advance is actually takes factoring to another level. Instead of factoring your receivables, we factor your deposits. So if you have $100,000 a month, right, we, will, we could help you arrange a loan for one times that amount and get it to you in three days, five days. Right, Louise, we got your money quick. Two days, all right, we get you the money. Because the, the, because the, the lender is actually factoring the deposits. And, and we're not gonna get into the mechanics of that kind of raise, but with $100,000 a month in revenue, we could get you $100,000 tomorrow. Now you have $100,000. Now the question is, what do you do with that $100,000? Yes. Oh, it's costly. Uh, if you're doing cash advances, that means you didn't like them, fine. <laughs> you said, no, we're not going to lend money to that, those people. We don't do that bad one. <laughs> yes. The comment was when you desperate. Basically, I, I give cash advance on credit card receipts. Well, there is a cash advance but, to credit card. Yeah, but that's, that's like when you're desperate because the rates are very high. Also, I have asset-based lending, which is usually much, much easier based on if you have assets or if you collateral. All right, I want to present an idea. It's desperate if you're paying your rent. It's not desperate if you're investing that money in a marketing campaign. That's going to lead to revenue. All right, so it's, de it's desperate if you're paying the mortgage, if you're surviving, if you're drowning, and now you need to survive. I, but it's not desperate if you're investing in marketing. <laughs> or going out to dinner. You know, one thing I didn't hear you mention is the, the difference between the cost of retaining a customer and getting a new customer. Because, huh? because there is still a cost of retaining a customer. Okay? And I'm finding the most successful companies that I'm looking to work with have a distribution system that ties together all three elements into a profit making machine. Yeah. So that, for example, their employees are the best customers. Mm -hmm. And their employees bring in more customers because nothing duplicates better than success. Right. So you know, when I see segmenting out the sales and marketing from the operations, that concerns me because if you've got good operations, you're making more sales. And if you've got good sales, your operations and your sales people, everything's working together in a synergistic way. But that's the point. You know, the the, the three, the three, no, no, no. The three feed one another. You bring in leads. And what do you do with the leads? Convert to sales. You convert them to sales. Then you have the customer. Now what do you want to do with the customer? You keep them. Now, Steve, right? What do you do with the money? Or what do you do with the costs? You keep costs what? You keep costs down. You keep costs down. So now you have these three components working in unison. And that, that, that was the part. So we're, but when we're talking about growth capital, we're talking about capital that's expensive. So if you're gonna get access to 100 or $200,000 in five days, in three days, then where do you wanna put the money in? Where, where's the highest return on investment? It's in sales and marketing. Because if you can invest it in sales and marketing and get three more clients, five more clients, 10 more clients, that you have a better chance of the, the cost of that capital being covered by sales and marketing than in any one of the three aspects of business. That's what the, 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 the general business is. still an adjustment basic issue, the cost of keeping a customer versus customer. Getting the cost of keeping a customer is always less than getting a new customer. That's not the point. If you get access to growth capital, you're not gonna put it in keeping in customers because it doesn't make any sense because it's different, it's different categories. You're talking apples and oranges. You understand? You always want to keep customers because that's the key to your profit.
but it, but it might also be an investment in piece of machinery that will get your production up or, or keep the cost down. It might be a computer system that does something practical to improve your business. Well, well, there are times where you do that, but when you do, when you're talking about uh, a, a cash advance, it's it, it's it's a high risk situation, right? So you can't bank on operations or, find, or, or cutting some operation costs being able to cover the cost of the capital. So you want to put it in sales and marketing. And you talked about if we put it, if you're using that money to pay the rent, you're desperate. But if you're using that money to go and get 10 new customers or 15 new customers, that's a more effective use of that money. You, what? Usually you're desperate if you're going for the cash advances, such as government, federal government closing down and all the companies had contracts with them, their cash flow stopped and they were waiting to use it. They had to cash advances. Right, let, let me try to address an issue here. What did we talk about the number one responsibility of an entrepreneur would be? What did we talk about? Growing the business. Or keeping cash into the company. That's what we talked about, right? It's not desperate, you're doing your job. By the way, we raised money for Louise to buy out her partner, and how much money did you put up of your own money? Zero. Zero. All right? So the point being is that um, I guess what we're talking about is get this, these words desperate out of your mind. If you own a business, your number one responsibility is to keep cash into your company. All right? And if you can get cash into your company, your job is now to take the cash and produce a profit with the cash that you've raised. And that's where your focus should be. It shouldn't be on whether you're desperate or not. Right? You shouldn't be paying attention to the cost. You should be paying attention to the return and what you do with the money. Because typically, once you're past the Brian phase, right, the Capital One phase, where they'll say, hey, we like you. We'll give you a line. If they say no to you, you have to go to other options. You're an entrepreneur. You need to bring cash into the company. And whether you get equity financing or debt financing, typically it's expensive. But the cost of it means nothing if you could produce a profit with it. And that's the point of raising money, is to produce profits with, to, with the dollar today as opposed to getting a dollar tomorrow. Let's now talk about some secrets here. Some, now we're going to talk about some real deal stuff. You know, we talked about some basics and some fundamentals. Now we're going to talk about some big boy or big girl strategies here. If you're playing these strategies, you're a big girl and you're a big boy. Um, all right, so we talked about growth, the new paradigm. And one part of the new paradigm is growth capital. There, there are places you can go and get money right away. You get 50000 you get 25000 you get 150000 As we have a client, Louise, RS Plus, Plus, right, where we just, on an ongoing basis, got her money. And, and now, because of that velocity of money, she's in a very strong cash positive position because she utilized the money properly, right? That's what happened, right? So that was the first paradigm. Second paradigm is now we're going to talk about ra raising money around deals. Raising money around deals. One of the reasons why businesses are not successful at raising money is that they don't raise money around deals. And what's a deal? A deal is, is, is actually a transaction that makes and produces income. So if, I, if I'm an investor and I invest X dollars, I invest 500,000, I invest a million dollars, and it produces 100 or 200 or $300,000 back to me, right? Then I get a return on an investment and I have a more tangible, uh, my analysis of that situation is more tangible because there's a deal, 
All right, and that's so one of the mistakes that that businesses make is they're always trying to raise money for the business. I want to raise money because I'm going to put more money in operations. I'm going to raise money because I'm going to decrease costs. Right? We already talked about putting money in marketing, but the the second thing you could do is put money in deals. Put and invest money in deals because it, deals produce money. All right? So one. Part of this equation is business acquisitions. A business can acquire other companies. And it's one of the most effective ways to grow a business. Right? Rather than go in and in, in chasing customers, new customers, and growing 10% or 15% or 5% a year, getting new customers, you can go and make an acquisition of a business that's either in your industry or maybe it's complementary to your business and you could grow your business by 20%, 30%, 40%, maybe in some cases double your business, maybe in some cases triple and quadruple your business. So that's a different kind of capital raise. And I guess the question becomes if business acquisitions, acquisitions is so lucrative, what prevents business people from actually doing it? And I want to get a little feedback from the audience. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. What? They don't know how to. Any other feedback? They don't have to. Acquisitions, yes. There's no guarantee an acquisition is going to succeed and it can be diluted. You don't have the right contact side of the specific industries that you want to acquire a business. Correct. You have to work at it like anything else. Like anything else. These deep pockets do need money. All right. So that, that's a good point. So let's talk about this. I, that's, that's two points I want to talk. Well, he talked about you need deep pockets. So there's a couple of points. There's two points I want to bring up with regard to business acquisitions. It's very important. One is the myth that you don't need to know what you're doing. You better know what you're doing. This is a sport that you better do research on. You better study it. You better know it. Marty and I are actually working on a couple of deals, right? One of the things that, that, that benefit Marty and I is our collective experience, right? We're not newbies. We're not new to the game. We know all the rules. And right, there's some new things we're learning too as we're going through the process. We're actually in processes of acquiring a couple of companies. But what's very interesting about this is even with our collective experience, we have some new things we're learning. This is a sport you have to study. But if you study it, and you get good at it, and it's a discipline that you master, wow, it's such an explosive business growth strategy. But you have to study it. You have to know it. You have to, in, it, you have to invest time in knowing all the intricacies associated with it. So, so one of the things I want to impress upon is that when it comes to business acquisitions, you need to know what you're doing so you can manage the other people around you. You can manage the attorneys, you can manage the accountants, you can manage the seller, the buyer, the lender, the investors. You need to know what you're doing. Now, there's a second um, point that was uh, made. Larry, right? Yeah. Larry. Larry made. You need, to, you, you need to have deep pockets. Let's talk about that. Deep pockets. All right. Here's the secret in business acquisitions. Here's the secret. You don't need money. What you need is a financial statement. You need a financial statement. Now, the question is, whose financial statement? Well, first and foremost, you need the business that you're trying to acquire. You need their financial statement. That's first and foremost. In other words, you need to find a good deal. And if you find a good deal, then raising money becomes a whole lot easier when you find a good deal. That's what it comes down to. 
you have to find a good deal, then the target company's financial statement becomes your best friend. Right? That's what it comes down to. That's the first and foremost. Now, the second financial statement that can help is your financial statement, your business's financial statement, and your personal financial statement. And the game is about combining your financial statement with the target's financial statement. Now, depending on the quality of the deal, if you have a crappy financial statement but you come across a great deal, you still might be able to raise the money. Now, this is Long Island, so I, could, I guess I could pose this question. Who knows who John Spano was? Long Island. Can anyone tell me? Jeff. Jeff, John Spano. Who is John Spano? All right. Well, he didn't try to. He actually did it. John Spano was a gentleman who bought the New York Islanders for $1,700. Now, he was a crook. Right? I mean, he went to jail. I mean, this guy, <laughs> this guy did, he was really out of, his, out of control, right? But I want to point out something. John Spano almost bought the Islanders with no money. And what did he do? What did he do? He found a great deal. Because the Islanders down the road got sold for about five times the amount that John Spano was like prepared to invest in. What did he do? He found a great deal. Now, he didn't go about it in a sophisticated, ethical kind of way. Had he done that, and uh, even with all his mistakes and all his craziness, John Spano was a day or two away from actually pulling it off. And what did John Spano do? He found the great deal. Now, John Spano was only worth like $5 million. And the net worth requirement to acquire an NHL team at that time in 1997 was a lot higher. Right? So, but what John Spano did was he found a great deal. So when you find a great deal, then the target's financial statement is your best friend. Now, if you find a pretty good deal, but you have a pretty good, strong business financial statement and you have good experience, then that might be okay too. But there's a myth. You said deep pockets. You don't need deep pockets. You need a financial statement, and you need the combination of financial statements. You need to know how to combine your financial statement with the target's financial statement. And your financial statement might be a personal financial statement. It might be a business financial statement. Or, or, and you combine it with the target's financial statement. If the target's financial statement is really good, then you have magic. So that's, that's part of what we're talking about. Now. So what makes a target's financial statement good? Equity, purely equity, or the model, or what? What makes, because the model you're not gonna find in a financial statement. All right, the, the target's financial statement um, really depends on a couple of things, right? The target's financial statements is one, that you have a good financial statement. All sales are booked, and there's actually identifiable profit on the statement. Maybe the owner takes salary, maybe there's a profit reported, maybe there's some perks within the financial statement that you can demonstrate as profit. All right, what makes a good financial statement is profit, right? That's the name of the game. One of the things you want to look at is what is the duplication. Can you buy another company? What is duplication that can be eliminated? You know, so if you, if you have two computer systems, you only need one. If you have two support uh, groups, you only need one for combining the two companies. You're ready to pay for the operations. That just becomes pure profit because whatever they're bringing in, they well, let's talk about that. So let, let's talk about the two types of business acquisitions. All right? The two types of business acquisitions. The first type of business acquisition was what we call a fold-in business acquisition. A, a, a fold-in business acquisition is when you find a business and independently it's not profitable. So as an independent entity, it's not a profitable entity. But because you have a business and you have staff and you have a facility, 
and you have infrastructure, you could acquire that company and suck it in. And, and what the, the term of art is fold it in. And oftentimes, this fold in transaction, the owners are struggling independently because they're not really good business operators. But what they're really typically good at is they're good at sales. So they have accounts, and they have clients, and they have relationships. So if you suck those relationships in, then you can suck them in. You could fold them in, and the acquirer could make more profit with the acquisition. And the good thing is, usually the financing for these kinds of acquisition is not from you, it's from the owner. Because typically, because the owner is not profitable, you can work out terms with the owner and get financing from the owner. Or you can make the owner, you could give the owner a, a payout on his book of business over time. So from a capital raising standpoint, you got the business for no money, right? And you were able to grow your company. Now we have a client here that we've worked with in the past called Corporate Coffee Systems. Corporate Coffee Systems, I believe, is the third largest uh, coffee distribu distribution firm in, in, in the tri-state area. Pretty substantial. Actually, the largest is one of um, uh, the one of the key sales managers of the largest one is in Ellen's one of Ellen's groups in Manhattan. We're very familiar with the coffee distribution business. And what's amazing with this fella, his name is David Henschel. And in fact, uh, Marty did some work with him as well. Represented him as uh, as an attorney. And this gentleman is very interested. He did 25 business acquisitions. 25. And he did, most of them were fold-in transactions where the owner was not that profitable and he was able to buy the business without putting out any money or very little money to get that book of business. So he would buy a business that he's doing maybe 30, 40 million in sales. The, the target is doing a million dollars in sales. And with one deal, he increases the sales of his business by one million dollars. One deal. And he didn't have to lay out any money. And all that, that million dollars, what happened was the owner became his salesperson. And all that money flowed down to the bottom line. It was a very interesting model. He did this 25 times. And that was one of his major growth strategies. Now, he had sales personnel. He had a marketing strategy. He had all that in place, too. But he constantly put together these folding acquisitions that was a major growth strategy. Now, the second, the second part, if you go to the previous one, if the second one is called what we call a standalone acquisition. Now, a standalone acquisition is a business that's profitable. It's really profitable. In fact, independently, it might be producing 300,000, 500,000, a million, two million, three million dollars in profit, right? And independently, it's a profitable entity. So if you're going to acquire that company, right, you're going to pay a multiple of that earnings. So if it's making a million dollars or 800,000, you're going to pay three, four times earnings for that business. Now, if you're in that business, and maybe you're not in that business, but you're, if, if you're in that business, the question becomes, as you stated, Larry, well, I need money. Well, maybe so, maybe not. Because if you're doing three million in sales, and what you're trying to buy is doing five million in sales, all right, three million in sale company, let's just say you're a payroll company, you do three million in sales, acquisition, five million in sales. What is the result of combining those two companies? How big? Eight million. Eight million. Now, you have to look at it from the standpoint of an eight million dollar company. So when you do a capital raise, you do the capital raise based on an eight million dollar company, not based on what you're doing. And an eight million dollar company, when you merge these two entities together, is, is, it, it produces more profit than a $3 million entity or a $5 million entity, right? So meaning your capital raising capability actually rises with a standalone acquisition so long as you can prove to the, the investor or the lender that you are capable of managing this operation. So want to quickly go into the power. Now, there's two, the two best secrets in, be, in small business, I believe. One is called the SBA guarantee. The other is called Regulation D. 
We'll talk about both. The SBA guarantee, right, and this is something that Brian, because Capital One is a preferred SBA lender. The SBA guarantee enables you to make business acquisitions, right? And what the SBA does is they guarantee 75% to 80%, depending on the loan, of the loan. So meaning if you find yourself an acquisition under the SBA program, the bank lends you the money. But the government guarantees 75% of the money. Meaning they'll lend you money to make a business acquisition. And the bank is comfortable in doing that because their collateral, the major form of collateral is the government. Now as a borrower, that doesn't mean you're not responsible for some money. You might have to put a down payment. You might have to invest some money, right? But when you think about it, the loan that you're borrowing is, is guaranteed by the government. It's one of the, it, it's one of the, uh, uh, the secrets of small business. Now, the reason why the SBA is typically, um, there's not a lot of knowledge about it is because there's uh, a, net a negative connotation with the SBA. People, people have experience of going to the SBA direct and having all types of problems. Who's had a bad experience with the SBA here? There you go, a couple, a couple hands. Who knows a lot about SBA loans here? There's some pretty smart people here, and about, about 80, 90 people, only like three people raised their hands I, that know about SBA loans. Arnie took an SBA loan uh, uh, in, during his career, right? He took an SBA loan to do one of your Burger Kings, I believe. Way back. Yeah, and that's way back. And that's when the SBA was an underdeveloped program. But, but, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. SBA, SBA stands, stands for, for Small, Small Business Administration. Business administration. administration. One, one of the things when you mention the people that have bad experience with the SBA, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how many people have bad experience with banks, and how much of that is dependent on how you dress for success? Because if they go to the SBA without dressing properly, or they go to the bank without dressing properly, they're not going to get what they want. Well, well, the key to the SBA is to find a good deal with good financial statements. You have good financial statements. You have good intentions. You have good credit. But the point is that the lender will make you a loan that they normally would not make with the SBA guarantee. And what it, do what it does is it opens the doors up for business acquisitions. You could own a business and buy another business in your industry or a business of similar and use an SBA loan to do it. And a lot of business owners don't know that. So they can simply just make an acquisition to double or triple the sales of their income. And the bank will do it because the SBA is guaranteeing 75% of it. Don't they often require personal guarantees though from the borrower? Correct. Let's talk about that. The borrower will, will guarantee the loan, right? So let, how about this? Let me give you an example. Ellen, you buy a house. And you buy a house for 800000 Throw a number out there, right? And you put a down payment of what? 80000 So the bank lends you... Yeah, probably not. Now the bank lends you 720000 Or maybe you put 100000 and the bank lends you 700000 right? Now, when you... Now, you personally guarantee the loan, right? And when you personally guarantee, you're responsible for how much money? All of it. But if you default, what's the first thing the bank does? Take the home. They're not going to waste time going after Ellen. They're going to take the home back first. They don't take it so quick. No. <laughs> you know, you just say it's like overnight, they don't get it. Wait. Get well, you're supporting my argument. They don't take it back so quick, but they take the home back. That's the first step, right? And then what technically, what is Ellen responsible for? The balance. The difference, the difference between the home value and the loan, right? And in some cases, maybe the house could be sold for the amount, depending on the market, right? Now, 
SBA guarantee is similar in a sense, right? There's a default. You brought a million dollars, right? It's on a business deal that didn't work out. The government guarantees 75 or 80% of the loan, right? There's a default. What's the bank do? I mean, you're responsible for the total amount, and they're going to go after you, but what are they banking on? They're going to go to the government, to the SBA, in the same way they would recoup the house. So what does that do? That means you're responsible for the difference. So what does the SBA do? The SBA enables you to make deals that you normally wouldn't be able to make, but at the same time, indirectly, and they would never tell you this, indirectly they reduce your risk because there's a government guarantee on the table. Because the bank, right Brian? The bank is more dependent, is when, when it comes to now get their money back, they'll go after the borrower, but who are they really gonna get their money back from? The government. So there's a misconception that the SBA lends money. They don't lend money, they guarantee money. They're like the form of collateral. They're like an insurance policy. And it's important for people to understand to be able to use that form of insurance to, to make deals. So does the bank make it easier for the borrower to borrow, or is he still in the same shoes as he were, as if it wasn't an SBA back loan? Thank you. Don't, 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 don't. If they what can come that? up with a position, it's easier for the bank. Well, that's why I'm asking the question. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, the answer to that question is that the, there are loans that the bank would, would, would do only, but they would only do it if there's an SBA guarantee on the table. But they also probably want to know that the person going for the loan can come up with that 20%. They, they still have to the make sure that the same thing. Important. You can't go to the bank and just because it's SBA, think you're going to have no, to be able to of, get something no, that you couldn't if it wasn't yes, But instead of going for the 100% loan, the bank, instead of the bank saying, okay, we'll give you a 100% loan, and you being responsible for the 100% loan, that's a huge risk for the bank. The bank now is saying, well, okay, you're only responsible for 20% because 80% I'm guaranteed by the government, so now my risk is only 20% with you. So if you can manage that risk of 20%, you have a better chance of getting that loan. And what, I'm, what my right? thoughts are and experience is that the bank does not handle the borrower in that fashion. They still handle it as the same way as before because they don't want to have losses to have to go to the SBA. So my clients are still I, 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 because they also I, have to get Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not an underwriter, but this is a big part of what we do. So if the business isn't cash flowing enough to support a loan, the SBA will provide that guarantee for the collateral to make sure that we can do it. So it makes it a hell of a lot easier. So, yeah. but and also to Gary's point, you still need to have good credit. There's a lot of due diligence that's done on behalf of us being a preferred lender for the SBA. We still have underwriting guidelines that we have to follow. So you might have to jump through a couple of extra hoops, but we will provide the loan more likely than not if the cash flow is not there in exactly. this case. Does the SBA go after the guarantor for the 80%? Yes. What's the requirement of the SBA? Is there any requirement of the SBA? All right, all right. Let me, let me try, to, try to answer this question. All right, all right. Hold up, hold up. Let me, let me, answer, let me answer this question. When I said raising money and finding a deal, what do you have to do first is find what? A good deal. Meaning a good business with good cash flow, and that helps, right? And then, right, what you have a borrower and there's financial statements that they have, right? The personal financial statement and their business financial statement and their credit and their experience. So in a deal, in a business acquisition, you're combining the two. And with the SBA, there's a mechanism in which lenders will be a little bit more aggressive in a business acquisition situation because there's a government guarantee involved, meaning 75% of the loan is guaranteed by the government, meaning there's collateral on the deal. What if there's a government shutdown? <laughs> <laughs> that would never you've, answered your, you've answered your question. <laughs> Let's go to that. Hey, Brian, let's go to the next one. So, 
What, what's the point here? Find a good deal, the money will follow. John Spano got a great deal, the money will follow. Huh? SBA? Well, uh, Sam, you might know this. What's the SBA limits? Anyone has questions, questions 
has to be in business for the typical SBA to be truly considered, despite the financial crisis. Well, it's, it's very flexible. You know, conventional bank financing two years, SBA, maybe you're, maybe you're a dentist, and you've been working for somebody for 10 years, and uh, that owner is retired, and you're gonna buy the practice. So, you know, you can slide right into an SBA 7 program. What about, what about new acquisition for a new business owner? All right, let's say somebody wants to acquire a franchise. Exactly. Okay, That's now there are, there's a website out there that documents what franchises are acceptable to the SBA. I don't know it off the top of my head. What is it? Something like that, something like that. Did you say? I think it's Franet. Franet, something like that. Yeah, Franet's the franchise franchise. Yeah. So if it's qualified for SBA finances, if uh, you have some related experience in the franchise you're looking to buy, they'll consider financing that. So, you know, it's, like I said earlier, it's not always about just the number, it's about the story. If you have related experience, you know, might be uh, qualified. Why don't, why don't, we're gonna wrap this up with, with the, I want to take a couple question and answers, but there's just one more point. I'm not going to get into the, the couple of points here. There's one point that I want to um, present. So now the, the Congress has passed now this new Jobs Act. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So I think there's two friends to small business with regards to capital raising. One is the SBA. I think that's a friend to small business. Why is the SBA a friend to small business? Because essentially, the government provides the collateral necessary on a loan that a business would not be able to provide on their own. Enabling a business to, uh, or a person to acquire a company, maybe a business to grow and expand, and this guarantee enables you to be able to get access to funds that you normally would not get in, uh, access to. And one of the reasons why there's a misconception about it is because people think of the SBA as this organization that lends money, and you go directly to the SBA, and what they don't understand is that there are lenders that are considered preferred SBA lenders, meaning they do all the paperwork, they underwrite all the loans, and all they're doing is going to the government to get the actual guarantee. And this program's been in, uh, uh, around for years. In fact, Arnie, who, who for years ago, got an SBA loan when the SBA program was, was, was underdeveloped, essentially, at that time, procured an SBA loan during that period of time. So the SBA has been around for years. It's gotten a bad rap because of the attempts by business owners to go directly to the SBA. The SBA is not a direct lender. Rather, you have to look at the SBA as an insurance company. <laughs> You know, and all they're doing is they're insuring the loan. They're guaranteeing the loan, and guess what? They're charging you for it. You're paying uh, an SBA fee, fee at the closing table. And that's how you have to look at the SBA. But it's a friend to small business because it enables you to get deals done when you normally would not have the resources to get them done. Now, the second um, friend to small business is what we call Regulation D. Right? And this is what it's associated with the Jobs Act. Right? And I, I'm a, this is the last kind of piece that I want to kind of share with everybody. Re Re regulation D is a friend to small business. So what's Regulation D? Regulation D enables a small business to raise money for their venture without having to register those securities with the SEC. Right. And, re and Regulation D is a series of six rules. And there's, a, there's Regulations 501, 502, 503, 504, 506, and 506, 501 to 506, that enable a small business to raise money without registering that security with the SEC, right? But there's a couple of things involved with this. One. There's Regulation 504 that enables a small business to raise money through what we call non-accredited investors. And you could raise up to a million dollars from non-accredited investors or accredited investors, it doesn't matter who, 
you could raise up to a million dollars, and you essentially could give the investor a piece of paper. They don't govern how you actually present the information. All they say to you is, you could raise a million dollars, and you have 12 months to do it. And that's called Regulation 504, right? And, but the problem with 504 is that you can't solicit investors, right? You, you can't solicit. You only can talk to people that you had a, pr a prior relationship with. Now, the second part of the Jobs Act is what we called Regulation 506. And really, it's Regulation 506. C. And what that enables you to do is enables you to raise an unlimited amount of money so long as you file with the SEC, you file with the state, you, put, you, 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 you actually fo you follow certain procedures with regard to disclosures, and now you could actually promote your venture to accredited investors and you could actually solicit. So right now, technically, I could promote a business venture if it was my venture as an executive, as an owner. I could actually promote my business venture. So long as I filed with the state, I filed with the SEC, I followed all the rules, and now, and when I promote the venture and people start to make inquiries, I make sure that the people who make inquiries are accredited investors. Well, if you're going to do this, you, you need a lawyer to help you file with the SEC, to help you file with the, uh, with the state. And um, our, our suggestion would be to put together a private placement memorandum, to, 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 uh, which is basically a business plan, but it's a business plan in a more sophisticated uh, version with all disclosures, and it's a, it's a plan that's necessary, that follows all the SEC rules. And, and, and it also shows your investors that you're doing this professionally and you're doing this legitimately. Is that what you meant before about illegal? Yeah, well, a lot of businesses are promoting their businesses illegally because they, 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 they promote their companies without filing with the state, without filing with SEC, and sometimes they promote the, the opportunity and they solicit without finding out whether they fall within these exceptions. Invest with Bernie? Yeah. Well, Bernie. oftentimes, if you invest in a company and they weren't filed, you see what happens is most companies who are raising money, if you raise money, even under Regulation 504, which enables you to raise up to a million dollars of non-accredited investors, meaning I could, ra I could raise money from anyone, right? I still have to file with my state. And most states, like New York is what we call a, a pre-filing state, meaning you can't talk to a citizen of New York without being filed. And usually there's filing fees you have to put up with the state in order to promote your investment. And then with regard to um, an actual memorandum, the problem is if you just do it with a business plan, the other side could claim that you didn't disclose certain things to them. And the only way to prove that you, 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 you went about Disclosing is by doing about it the legitimate way, by putting together a private placement memorandum. So when I say most businesses raise money without by breaking the law, they do it in illegitimate ways. They do it by soliciting, trying to solicit investors when they shouldn't, and they do it by not filing with the SEC, the, the state, or in some cases the SEC if they're trying to raise amount of money beyond a million dollars. What's the limitation of this money? What's the limit? In terms of what? In terms of what? How much? Well, depending on where you file with. If you file with Regulation D-506, you could raise an, an unlimited amount of money. Regulation, uh, Regulation D. D. Regulation D-506B fi uh, uh, enables you to raise an unlimited amount of money. What you have to do is B, B, B. Regulation D-506B enables you to raise an unlimited amount of money, right? So long as 35, so long as, and they allow you to raise up to 35 investors could be non-accredited. 
and then the rest has to be accredited. Unlimited amount of money, but what you have to do is you have to file with the SEC, you have to file with the state, and you have to provide certain disclosures to the non-accredited investors. So what's the difference between B and C? What C enables you to do is promote your investment opportunity, right? and enables you to solicit. So in other words, you can now solicit and promote your investment opportunity, but you must stick to accredited investors strictly. So for instance, at this forum, if I wanted people to invest in BizGrow, so long as I'm filed with the state, and so long as I'm filed with the SEC, I could actually have a slide and actually try to raise money for BizGrow. Right? But I have to be filed with the state, I have to be filed with the SEC, and if someone makes an inquiry and tries to interface with me to learn more about the opportunity, then I have to make sure and take measures to make sure that they're an accredited investor. Meaning they have a net worth of a million dollars or more, or 200,000 plus in income. Two questions, one is what's the corporate structure you would have to go for that? And what would be the cost legal fees to go with that lawyer and be able to do the fund with the state and the SEC? What's that start up? Well, the, the problem is if you want to go for an unlimited amount of cash, which is 506C, and raise money, right, in that mansion by soliciting, it could cost between twenty and forty thousand dollars in legal fees to put the private placement memorandum together. There's also going to be a cost with the state and there's going to be a filing fee with the SEC. And the corporate structure would be, it's not going to be such a after escrow. No, it's going to be, no, it's going to be a corporate. C corporate. C corporate. C corporate. C corporate. If you use one of these exemptions, uh, aren't you limited in your follow-up capital raises on some, some occurrences that if you use one of these, you want to raise more money, aren't you more limited? Well, 506 so enables, enables you to uh, raise, uh, an, raise unlimited an unlimited amount, amount, amount of money. Let's say you use one of the other. Well, well, use 504, that limits you to a million, million dollars. But non-credited investors. Unless you want to go, go to a, a, a uh, crowdfunding uh, site and stick to accredited, accredited investors. When you go through this process with the 504 or the 506, are you then a public company as far as 10K and 10Q filings? You're not a public company. You're not a public company. company. You're not, but you're not, if you're trying to raise over a half, over a half a million dollars, dollars you must do it in financial, financial statements. If it's 500,000 or less, it should be office certified, certified financial, financial statements. statements. When you said you could just listen here, you said before you have a, a, a relationship with the people, then you don't have to, you, know, you, you can't you can't listen to a prior relationship. I know of a company that does a network marketing company, financial services space, that went to their network marketing people and raised like $2 million knowing they weren't accredited, just signing promissory notes. That's bad, that's bad. There's something wrong with that, is there? First of all, the, the SEC only allows you to raise up to a million dollars under Regulation 504 if you're gonna focus on non-credit accredited investors. Okay? Okay. Uh, and if you're gonna raise money from non-accredited investors, you cannot solicit people who you didn't have a previous or prior business relationship with. Yeah, but if, if, if uh, all right. So let's just say, let's just say uh, you got Sueda, right? Ellen knows Sueda, and I promote my stock, right, to Ellen. And now Ellen goes and promotes to Sueda. That's a very gray area. It has to be someone you have a previous a prior business relationship if you're going to focus on non-credit investors. If not, right, what the law now allows you to do is this, it, it allows you to go and tell the person, go to my uh, crowdfunding site, go to Kickstart, Kickstarter, and you'll find the information there. But if you're going to raise money in that methodology, it has to be through that site and they have to be accredited investors. You also did a debt, debt convertible debt, does that, does that change it at all? It doesn't matter. If you're going to use security as a, as a collateral instrument, it doesn't matter whether it's debt or it's equity, it's still considered a security used as collateral instrument. 
So what does, that, what does this do? Well, I think it opens up the ball yard for raising money, but I also think it, what it does is it forces businesses to do it legitimately, and they have to follow all the rules. But the good news is, if you do it legitimately, business people will look upon you with, you'll have more credibility because you're doing it the right way. All right, so quick question and answers, huh? Yeah. We can help you. Okay. We'll, we'll speak to you about it. Yes. We know enough about it. Come to us. We'll talk to you about it. All right. Any questions? Because it's getting late, and we'll just quick questions. He's asking if it's any business entity that can apply for 501, 506 under your experience. Any business could raise money under a 504, a 505, or a 506. Any business. Well, 501, 2, and 3, just, it, just, it just describes what the definition of accredited investor is. Or it's 504, 505. All this is, by the way, on the sec.gov website. You get the, the, the latest rules. Now, one last thing. Uh, I don't know if there, there was a slide here for it. We, um, so here it is. This is what BizGrow is doing. In the upcoming months, we are going to actually start operating an e-commerce site called BizGrow University. And what BizGrow University does is it'll give access to business people, their advisors, to information, to e-books, to training, to reports to um, blogs, and it'll probably be done uh, on a subscription basis. But what it does is it enables us to, 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 to actually communicate with our community uh, about things like Regulation D. We want to be able to educate the business community and bring forth materials that will enable you to be a better business person or a better advisor. And uh, I just want you to be on the lookout for that. We will be launching that probably early next year. And you know, I thank everybody for attending this seminar, and um, and I appreciate everyone's support. Some of you have gone to some of our past events, and we're doing another event in Manhattan, November 12th, and be on the lookout for that.